Right. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and glory and gratitude and reverence be to the Lord of the worlds, who is Allah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Wahdahu la sharika lah. And he is alone and we worship him alone without setting up partners or rivals with him. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his final, is indeed his servant and his last and final messenger. And after that, brothers and sisters who are here today with us, I extend my greetings to you, scriptural greetings, which are may the peace of God be with you all. And I start by extending gratitude to Pastor Rudolf Bushoff, or Bosov, sorry for the... So who organized this? And I, I also like to extend my gratitude to the doctor, the dean of Rema Bible College for letting us use the facility today. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for making time and coming to this event and to talk about God. There are many people out there today speaking and talking about politics and, uh, you know, sports and all the other things that, you know, have no uh, benefit to our lives. But we are here today trying to talk about God and trying to find out what and who God is, and uh, after we find that out, we find out what God wants from us. So, how many of you here today have heard the concept of, uh, have listened to the concept of God in Islam from a Muslim perspective, by a Muslim speaker before, by a show of hands? Quite a few. So, many of you haven't, I, I take it as many of you haven't heard this before. And I'm going to be very frank with you. The concept of God in Islam does not have any ambiguity or mystery behind it. It's a very clear thing that even a child can grasp and go with at home. It's a very simple thing. We believe that God is one. We believe that he is unique. And we use the word Allah to describe God. When you hear Allah, it is the unique name, Arabic name that is given to the one true God. We believe that God is the all-powerful. We believe that God is the all-merciful. We believe that God has the dominions of the heavens and the earth. We believe that God does not share his essence with his creation. We believe the creator does not share his essence with the creation. And when I talk about essence in philosophy, essence is the property or set of properties that define an entity or a substance. So the essence of God, God has his essence by necessity. And without his essence, he ceases to be God. The definition of God has to be with his essence, the essence of God, which we believe in. We Muslims believe that God is indivisible. And Pastor Rudolph is going to come after me. You know, today we, are, uh, we just decided who is going to come first uh, during the debate. We threw a coin, and uh, unfortunately, I had to start. You know, no debater wants to, wants to begin. So Rudolph is going to come after me, and he's, try, he's going to try to divide God. But what I, what I want us to do today, we are at a Bible college. I'd really like if we based our arguments on Scripture, if we deduced and we, you know, got our doctrine from the Bible. Not us giving our doctrines to the Bible, but the Bible giving us the doctrines. That's what I'd really like to see today. So, we Muslims believe that God is indivisible. He cannot be three in one. We cannot divide him into any number. He's just one, one and unique. We also believe that God does not share his divinity, and he is unequaled in his divinity, meaning that there is no co-equal with God or something that is similar to God in everything that he is. 
We also believe that God has names and attributes, asma wa sifat. We believe that these names are an epitome of God's, you know, uh, characteristics. We believe that God, for example, we cannot say as Muslims, God is mercy. We say God is the all merciful, meaning any mercy that exists in this world emanates from God and comes from God. And we don't say like the Christians say that God is love. We do not say that. We say that God is the all loving. God is al wadud, meaning God is compassionate. He is all loving. And all the love that exists in this world comes from God. So this is the God that we believe in in Islam. And God says he sent messengers for this simple uh, uh, doctrine and yet very heavy and very important doctrine that we should all believe in. He says in chapter 21 verse 25 of the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولِ And verily, we did not send a prophet before you, O Muhammad, إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ Except we revealed unto him that there isn't, that they should preach to the people, there is no deity worthy of worship except myself, who is Allah. Meaning there's only one deity that is, that is supposed to be worshipped and religious, you know, we are supposed to render religious homage to this one divine, divine being who is God. And what we have in Islam is the Prophet, peace be upon him, one time the idolaters came to the Prophet and asked him to define God, what we are doing today. The concept of God, the topic we are discussing today is the concept of God in Islam and Christianity. So the Prophet was asked by the mushrikeen, the idolaters, they asked him to define who God is and God sent down revelation. And perhaps this is the most important surah that a person can take the concept of God from. Chapter 112, verse 1 to 4 of the Quran. The Prophet is told to say, Qul Allahu Ahad. Say, O Muhammad, that He is Allah, the One. So, Muhammad is told to say to the people that God is only one and He does not have, have partners. Allah Samad, God is the all sufficient, self sufficient Master of whom all creation needs, but he does not need his creation. He, is neither, he neither begets nor was he begotten. And there is nothing comparable to him. There is nothing comparable or like unto God. So this is what Muslims believe in. Muslims have this criteria to define who God is and who God is not. God is not begotten, neither does he beget. And he is self-sufficient and he is one and unique. We are told in so many verses of the Quran, I can quote a list of verses, chapter 37, verse 4, Inna ilahakum lawahid, that you are verily your Lord and your God is only one God. And we are also told in Surah chapter 20, in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 46, we are told to tell the Jews and the Christians, wa ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid. This is something I want all of us to understand today. We are told to tell you that our God and your God is one God. Understand the sequence of these words. Our God and your God is one God. Not your God and our God is one God. Our God as Muslims, the divine being whom we worship, the only true God who we worship, and the God of the Christians, meaning the creator of the Christians and the Jews, is one God. This is what God is in the Quran. And we are not only told to worship this one God, but we are told to shun all other deities who are called Tawut. God says in the Quran, Verily we sent forth to every nation prophets and that they should worship God alone, and they should shun all false deities. Tawut consists is a very wide term. It consists of all false deities. It consists of Satan. It consists of devils. It consists of uh, pagan rituals. It consists of worshipping stones and idolatry. It consists of worshipping angels. It consists of worshipping prophets, like the prophets whom have been raised, their status have been raised so much as to be co-equals with God, like we are going to see in the next 25 minutes when uh, Pastor Rudolph ca ca comes to the stage. He's going to elevate Jesus, peace be upon him, whom we, we uh, hold reverence to as a prophet of God. He's going to raise him as a co-equal with God. 
So we are told not to worship all these things. They come under the ta'ut, the saints, the graves. Everything that is worshipped besides God is not allowed to be worshipped in Islam. And we are told to worship uh, God alone in his, you know, divinity and his, uh, uh, you know, uniqueness. One more thing is that I'd like, together with explaining the simplicity of God in Islam, the simplicity of the nature of God in Islam, I'd like to showcase that the, the message of the Bible, which you're using today, the Bible is consistent with the Islamic doctrine of, you know, uh, with the Islamic belief or the Islamic concept of the nature of God. The Bible supports the Quran completely. We have seen that the Quran only calls to one God. And if we look at the Bible, we divide it into so many parts. And each part we look at, we find that God is one and unique. We look at the very first commandment again. That, uh, of course, Pastor Rudolf, and this is not an attack. Pastor Rudolf is going to come here today, and he's going to break the very first commandment. God says, you know, you say that you have been given ten commandments. Moses was given ten commandments. But the funny thing is that the first commandment will be broken here today in front of all of us. God says in the book of Exodus chapter 20 verse 1, and he says that God is speaking himself. He says God said all these words and told Moses, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the house of slavery in, from Egypt. And he says in verse 3, chapter 20 verse 3 of Exodus, thou shall not have any other gods besides me. So this is the very first commandment that is going to be broken here today by uh, the, the preaching of the Trinity and the hypostatic union, which we are going to come to later on. So God is one and unique. And when Moses was told this at Mount Sinai, what happened? Moses went to his people, Israel, and what did he tell his people? He told them something known as the Shema, which I am very sure the pastor will also use. And I'm waiting for him to use it, uh, because there's this doctrine that has been, you know, created by uh, Pastor Rudolf uh, Bosov and his peers that has not existed before, trying to, you know, play around with the Hib Hebrew words. Shema Israelu, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. So the Echad means one. It says, Ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. That is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Very clear words. This shows, I'm quoting from the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, the Torah, if you like. The Torah is very consistent with the message of the Quran, that there is only one God and there is no, he does not have rivals or partners or co-equals. We go to the books of the prophets and we find out the same. We look at the books of Isaiah. We look at the book of 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 60, for example. It is very clear that God is only one. We come to Jesus, peace be upon him, because of the time. And Jesus is preaching and answering questions. And one of the scribes, Jesus lived in a community that was Jewish. And who knew Hebrew more than Pastor Rudolph will, will ever know. And these people lived with Jesus and they were Unitarians, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. One of the scribes came to Jesus, that is Mark chapter 12 verse 28. And he found that Jesus was answering the disciples well. And what happened? He asked Jesus a very important question. He, he asked him of all the commandments, which is the first or which is the greatest. So Jesus is being asked this question in front of everyone. And what does Jesus do? He quotes the Shema, the same thing that Moses said. He says, Shema Israelu, Adonai Ilahinu, Adonai Echad. That he, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, one God, one Lord. So Jesus says, the Lord our God. He does not say the Lord your God. He includes himself and he says, the Lord our God is one God. So this is what Jesus preached. Jesus continues to preach. And he gives a very important doctrine that each and every one of us needs in this room. In the book of John chapter 17 verse 3, Jesus says, he talks about something very important, eternal life. So any one of you here, if you want eternal life, if you want felicity, if you want paradise, what we Muslims call Jannah, Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, not I. 
Jesus says, time is running. I have 10 minutes. So Jesus says that they may know you, not I. That they may know you, the only true God. This, you know, dismantles the Trinity at so many levels. Jesus says if you want to go to, it, if you want eternal life, he says that they may know you, not you, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, he doesn't say that. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus Christ, and you know, and. What is, what is and? It is used to divide between a sentence. Interjection, if you like, in the English grammar. So and comes and he says the only true God is you, not I. So Jesus does not include himself in the Godhead and does not grant himself divinity. This is what Jesus preached. So, so far we know that Jesus preached the same message of the Quran. Moses preached the same message of the Quran. We go to Paul. And we find that Paul in Galatians chapter 3 verse 20, he says that God is one. And he, there's even a more interesting verse in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. Paul says, for there is one God. Paul says, for there is one God. And one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. He didn't say the man God he didn't say the hypostatic union. He didn't say the trinity. He didn't say all these words which we're trying to push into the Bible. He said that there is only one God. And there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So this is the concept of God that was held by all the prophets. And it's the concept that the Bible preaches. The Bible, if we use the Bible alone, and this is a challenge. Before Pastor Rudolph speaks, I'm going to give you a challenge from the Bible. I'm going to give 5,000 rand today. I feel very rich today. So I'm going to give 5,000 rand today because I know Pastor Rudolph is a Trinitarian and he's coming to preach the Trinity and the hypostatic union. So if Pastor Rudolph gives me a verse which clearly supports the Trinity, I'm not going to ask him. You know, this, this question has been asked a lot. Show us the, the term Trinity in the Bible. I'm not going to be that petty. I'm just going to ask you the question. Give me a single verse in the Bible where it says, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is something people are pushing down our throats. It is not in the Bible. So if you find where it says, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Or it says even God the Son, not the Son of God. God the Son. If we have such a verse, then I'm ready to give 5,000 rand today. And as I said, we are in a Bible call, so let's try to use the Bible as much as we can. One more thing is that the concept of God in both Christianity and Islam, I would say, is that God clearly identifies himself in the scripture. Pastor Rudolph would agree with me that the Quran states who God is very clearly. And what he is not. And the Bible states clearly who God is and what he is not. I'm going to give you some few examples. The Quran clearly puts it. Chapter 2, verse 255. A very important verse in Islam, the Ayatul Kursi. It states, Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. La ta'akhudu sinatu wa la naum. God neither sleeps nor does he slumber. This is what God is. He's putting that criteria for us to judge who is God and who is not. If we read the Bible, the same thing. The book of Psalms, chapter 121, verse 4. Tell me if I have five minutes. The book of Psalms, chapter 121, verse 4 says, that he neither sleeps nor does he slumber. He that is the watcher of Israel. So God does not sleep in the Quran or in the Bible. If we look at the Bible, we find Jesus who is called the eternal second person of the Trinity, what does he do in the book of Luke and in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 23? He went into the vessel and his disciples followed him. And they found him and the waves came and they found him sleeping. So Jesus was sleeping. Jesus was in deep slumber. He was sleeping. The Bible says God does not sleep. The Quran says God does not sleep. So Jesus cannot be God. The Quran continues the same chapter, chapter 2, verse 255. 
له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض. To God belongs the dominions of the heavens and the earth. So God is that rich. To Him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. I'm going to go very quickly. So bear with me because of I have five five minutes left. So God, to God belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Does the dominion of the heavens and the earth belong to Jesus? No. We all know that Jesus was homeless. He didn't have a place to sleep. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He says so himself in the red letter Bible, if you have it. The book of Matthew chapter 8 verse 10, 20, Jesus says, And foxes have holes, and the birds in the air have nests, but the Son of Man, i.e. Jesus, has nowhere to rest his head. So Jesus cannot be God. We continue with more verses from the Quran, chapter 50 verse 38 of the Quran. He says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Verily we created the heavens and the earth. وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ And whatever is between it, six in six days. وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ لُغُوبِ And verily fatigue did not touch us. We didn't get weary. So God does not get weary. The same thing in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28. God does not get tired. Jesus was tired at the well of Jacob. The book of John chapter 4 verse 6. So Jesus cannot be God. Because this is the nature of God and this is the essence of God and Jesus comes short of that. And mind you, man by definition is not God. Before we go to more explanations, we have a man and we have God. God cannot be a man because man by definition is not God. For example, I can, a plant cannot be an animal. I cannot say... To you, and, and, and Rudolf will, will surely ask this question, why can't a man be God? It's like saying, why can't this flower be an elephant? We know that the flower is a plant by definition. And we know that the elephant is an animal by definition. So the plant cannot be an, an animal and the animal cannot be a plant. And we are talking about creation. When we have two sides, we split things into two sides and we have the creator and the subjects, which are the creation. The subject cannot be... You know, the creator cannot be creation and the, the creation cannot be. And if God becomes a human being, then he loses his, his essence as God and he does not become a human being anymore. Just like we are proving that Jesus is not, is not God. And God says clearly in the Bible as well that he is not a man. The book of Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 and the book of uh, Hosea chapter 11 verse 9. Jesus, uh, God clearly states, he says that I am not a man. I am God and I am not a man. Hosea chapter 11 verse 9. Jesus was a man. Jesus says in the book of John chapter 8 verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which has had from God. He, we are told in the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 22. We are told, hear O men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth. What does it say? The second eternal person of the Godhead? No, it doesn't say that. Jesus of Nazareth, hear O men of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Approved to you by God through wonder, signs and miracles which God did through him. So Jesus cannot be God. And we can go through this so many times. God's age cannot be calculated. The book of Job chapter 36 verse 26. We cannot count the age of God. Jesus' age was counted. We have the book of Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. Where Jesus was a baby and he was in, in diapers. What we call diapers today. So can, if, if, if Rudolph is going to tell us today that God is... Uh, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. At that particular time when he was circumcised at the eighth day in the book of Luke chapter 2 verse 21. Would you agree that Jesus was 100% baby and 100% God? Does that make sense? It does not make sense to start with. And the argument goes on. Because if God comes into the womb of a woman, what if a woman decides to abort? Then God ceases to exist. The argument fails in so many levels. We go ahead, we are talking about the age of God that cannot be counted in the book of Job chapter 36 verse 26. Jesus' age was counted. He was eight days old when he was circumcised. Jesus was 12, days, 12 years old in, in the book of Luke chapter 2 verse 41. In the book of Luke chapter 3 verse 23, Jesus was 30 years old when he, he started preaching. So Jesus' age can be calculated. God's, God's, how many minutes do I have? What? Time up? Can I have a minute to finish up? Because, yeah. 
So Jesus cannot be God. This is very simple. God is spirit. The book of John chapter 4 verse 24. Jesus was flesh and bones. We are told God is spirit and you shall worship in, in spirit. Jesus was not spirit. We look at the book of Luke chapter 24 verse 39. We are told that Jesus, Jesus says himself from his own, his own mouth. He says, look, I'm flesh and bones. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. So he's clearly telling you that he's not God. God cannot be tempted. The book of James chapter 1 verse 17. Jesus was tempted. The book of Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. So the argument fails in so many levels. I don't want to continue this. But just like I said, there's 5,000 rand on the table. And I really want uh, Pastor Rudolph to win this money today. Thank you very much for this. I'm going to thank you for being here. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to jump right into it because I've got so much to share with you. Uh, and he did a fantastic presentation. And I, I laud him for that. And I thought, uh, in due course, I'm going to return the favor. And I'm going to... Uh, in this short period of time, this 26 minutes that I have, uh, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going uh, to correlate and, and describe the understanding of the Christian faith when it comes to the understanding of biblical Trinitarianism. And then we're going to look at Tawheed. We're going to look at the conception of God in Islam. Uh, that was already well described. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to show that there are difficulties that Muslims also need to account for uh, when it comes to the conception of unity of Allah or Tawheed. Uh, let me start off by saying yes, and I just want to give an outline uh, uh, of what uh, Abdul Rahman has described. When we speak about the Trinitarian worldview, what we say is, is that, that in the Bible, the Bible stipulates quite clearly, uh, first of all, that there's only one God, eternal and immutable. Uh, as a result of that, we can also see in the Bible that there are three eternal persons described in Scripture, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and these persons are never to be identified with one another. That is, they are carefully differentiated as persons. Uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are identified as being mutual and fully deity, and that is, the Bible teaches that the deity of Christ and also that the deity of the Holy Spirit is evident. Uh, also, please note, we are not saying that the Father is the Son, or the Son is the Spirit, or the Spirit is the Father. Uh, there's common misconceptions surrounding that, but what we are articulating when it comes to the biblical text is simply the following. Uh, and I'm going to start with this because there's a plethora of information that we can go through. Uh, when we look at the triune God specifically, we can see that there's distinct roles that is described in the scriptures. There's an order or an economy between them uh, in the persons of the Trinity. And let me give you a few notable scriptures that would sound familiar to you, like Matthew 28, verse 19, John 15, 26, and Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 14. First, in addition to creating the universe, according to Mark chapter 13, verse 19, uh, and predestining believers unto salvation, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, the Father is responsible for directing the Son and the Spirit in their creative and redemptive work. And that's what we see in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, and John chapter 3, verse 16. The secondly, we can see in this economy of the Trinity, the Son is the mediator between God and the creation, according to John 17, 23, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And especially between the Father and believers. Uh, and therefore, we can see that the Son uh, is actually the one to whom uh, it is given to pour the Holy Spirit out um, according to John 15, 26 and Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, then we also see uh, in the distinct roles that the Son glorifies and completes the work of the Father and the Son uh, gives creation back unto God in prayer and worship. And we see that in John 14, 26, also in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And then what we see uh, is that there's a archetypical glory of God that is preeminent in the text as well. Uh, but what we see is that the object of the Father and the Son's affection is venerated by the Spirit of God. So we can see that each member of the Trinity functions equally and exhaustive, and each of them divine, uh, exhausts the divine nature. Now again, there's so much I can get into when it speaks of this, uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skim over this. Uh, so what we see is that when we look at the triune God as described in the scriptures, we can see that there's a harmony between unity and diversity. Uh, we can see quite clearly that uh, there is a, a strictly eternal, a exhaustive personal relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and we can also see that this indicates that this God, uh, in its actual uh, self-awareness, uh, is fully uh, to and unto himself. And we can see also quite clearly uh, that is regarded as unipersonal, but also as tripersonal. Now, 
And this is important for us to understand because when we read the text of Scripture, we can delve into the New Testament, and I would also surmise also the Old Testament. There's a plethora of Scriptures that can show quite clearly that there is one God. We affirm, for instance, the Shema, and we will look at the nature of the Shema shortly. So when we look at the Muslim understanding of uh, uh, Allah, we can see quite clearly that Abdul Rahman described it beautifully. Uh, I thought it would be my task tonight to describe it for the students that are not here. Um, and I hope the students made notes because you're going to definitely receive uh, a question in the exam because of this. But he described it beautifully. But let me also add and let me read to you a very important surah in the Quran, which is Surah Al-Iqlas. And it says the following. It says, Kul huwa alu ahat alahu asamat la yalit walam yulat walam yakun lahu kurfuvan ahat. Say he is God, the one, God, the absolute. He begets not, nor was he begotten. And there's nothing comparable to him. Now, let me describe this because this was not mentioned, that there are three categories of Tawheed. There's uh, Tawheed ar uh, the, the that maintains the unity of lordship. Tawheed al-Asma, uh, was Sifat, which maintains the unity of Allah's names and attributes. And then there's also Tawheed uh, al-Ibada, uh, which is the, ma the maintenance of the unity of Allah's worship. Uh, and the reason I want to highlight that is because um, now what I want to do uh, in my last 20 minutes or so is I want to ask three questions and evaluate both worldviews in light of those three questions. Number one, I want to look at God as, God as absolute unity and compound unity. I want to look at God as love, uh, and I'm going to describe the words Yahweh uh, just for the distinction and Allah. Uh, and also, thirdly, I'm going to look at the nobility of Yahweh and the nobility of Allah. God willing, I'll get through it. Okay, so when we look at the absolute unity of God as it is described, we heard the Shema being quoted, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Aleheinu, uh, Adonai Echad. Uh, we can see quite clearly that in the Hebrew language, when you read it in the Hebrew, it describes a unity of God. But what is important is that this scripture hyphenates and says the following, that God cannot be divided. Uh, we actually, uh, when we look at the doctrine of the Trinity, we, we need to emphasize and say that, that, that this does not mean that God is a, a sort of a composite being made up of three gods, but rather that he is a unity. And as a unity, God cannot be divided. Uh, he spoke of the indivisibility of God. Christians all to that as well. God cannot be divided. Neither is he made up of multiple substances. Uh, the members of the Trinity are not separate beings within the one divine essence. Uh, and God is one in number for Christians as well. Uh, there's an absolute and a compound unity. Uh, and we can see quite clearly that there's an interesting facet both in Judaism and Christianity where the word ichat describes and bears the essential meaning and not of an absolute one but of a plural one and there are numerous scriptures that we can draw upon to describe the absolute unity but also this uh, uh, compound unity that is evident within the text. So uh, Dr. Michael Brown mentions that uh, actually achat simply means one exactly like our English word one. Uh, and while it can refer to a compound unity, just as the English word can, as one team or one couple, etc., it does not specifically refer to, in this setting, uh, to an absolute unity. Uh, and again, when we look at Maimonides, when we look at all the Jewish scriptures in antiquity, uh, some of the rabbis, and I can quote some of the rabbis, we can go into that, actually mention that. And let me just quote two for you. Uh, Rabbi Spanger and Zwerfberg uh, actually notes that the priority in the Old Testament scripture has always been, when it speaks of the Shema, to hyphenate the word obey. Uh, the Lord your God and the Shema were prayed every day to declare the individual's obedience uh, of adherence to the one God of Israel. Let me give you what liberal scholars say, um, uh, because I can give you Christian scholars, but let me give you two liberal scholars. Uh, James D.D. Uh, uh, Dunn, when he speaks of the Shema and how it reads in the Hebrew, he says the following. He says, the Shema most likely refers to Yahweh's uniqueness. He alone is God and he needs no other gods to assist him. However, this unique and incomparable God is also for Israel our God, not because of what Israel deserves or merits, but because of God's graciousness. Uh, in fact, what he is saying and what he's getting at is, is that this unity that is described in the Shema is not an absolute unity. In actual fact, it describes a higher purpose. So what, what happens when we look at the unity of Allah uh, uh, as described uh, in the Quran? Uh, as noted earlier, the Islamic conception of, of Allah is that he's the ultimate soul, undivided creator, who is absolutely one. Uh, and, and here's the problem that I want you to think of. 
The problem arises when we clear, uh, when we see clear inconsistencies with this idea. Uh, Muslims that hold to the absolute eternality of Allah find it hard to recognize that even the Quran itself have negated distinctions within God's absolute unity, which implies a direct violation of his essential unity. Uh, we can therefore see uh, that uh, the unity of the eternal Quran existed with Allah. Uh, we see that in Surah 8, 5, 21, 22, in Surah 43, verse 3 to 4. Uh, and Muslims agree that the Quran is in heaven and it's uncreated, it's perfect, it's an expression of the mind of Allah, but its essence is not Allah himself. Now listen to this. There's something that shares the eternal nature of God in heaven, yet it is not God. Uh, also, a little bit later, uh, there was a few comments made, and I would go a little bit deeper into that. But when we look at the unity of Allah's attributes, even, that exists with Allah, uh, and he mentions some of the attributes uh, that is actually mentioned, uh, we can see that Orthodox Muslims attribute speech to Allah as an eternal attribute, like his knowledge, or might, but do not allow Trinitarian Christians to do the same or have the same courtesy when they explain the unity of God uh, or his being, yet being three, yet in his own revelations, we can see that his essential unity is not violated. Christ is therefore the expression of the divine will without being the same person as the divine will. Uh, we can see quite clearly that um, also uh, that one of the earliest uh, contentions in Islamic history uh, is between the Asherites and the Mutazilites. I wish we had time to go into that, uh, which is also uh, quite a fair evaluation. But what we see is simply that there are certain inconsistencies when it comes to the unity of Allah. Secondly, I said I want to look at the love of Yahweh uh, and also uh, the love of Allah. Uh, first of all, uh, we have already described and we said that for us, uh, God in the Christian conception is a loving unity. Now listen to what Robert Leatham says. He says, only a God who is truly triune can be personal and only the Holy Trinity can be love. Human love cannot be possible if there's nothing to reflect the nature of this love towards. Therefore, the Trinity of persons in union and communion actually expresses the perfect picture of love. Uh, a solitary nomad cannot love, and since it cannot be love, neither can it be a person. And if God is not personal, neither can have he be uh, in a, a pers uh, all persons that can love us. Uh, the disciple of Jesus, Matthew, writes, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out from the water and suddenly the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God descend on him like a dove and it rested on him. And the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We can see quite clearly that in the Christian conception of God, the priority of love is always that used to state that God by his very self nature is love. Now let me just give you this because this is very important. We can see th that for this Christian truth to, to, to actually work, Richard Swinburne says the following about the love of God. He says the perfect goodness requires a first divine being to produce a second and incorporation with the second to produce a third. Uh, and, but that there is no necessary to produce the fourth, he says. He says, there is something profoundly imperfect and therefore inadequate divine, uh, ad inadequately divine in a solitary divine individual. Uh, and here's the question. If Allah is love, who did he love before the world created? Uh, here's another question. For Allah to love, we heard tonight that there's a statement made that Allah is not dependent on anything. Let me say, for Allah to love, he had to create something outside of himself that could be dependent on that love. And therefore, the creation is dependent on his love and Allah and his creation. This made some of the uh, Muslim scholars like Al-Fabri, uh, Ibn Sina, uh, and even uh, some of the earlier scholars describe and say that the, 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 the created world order and Allah have always existed together uh, as a whole. But we know that's just simply not truth. Uh, so we can see quite clearly that in the Christian conception of love, God has always been a self-loving community because God by his very nature is love. Now what about the Islamic conception of Allah's love? My Muslim friends, uh, we heard that Allah is our dude, uh, the one who loves those who does good and bestows his benefic benefits on, in, on them in compassion. Um, yes, uh, what I am saying and contending tonight is not that Allah is known by one of his names as love or al wadud. The first thing that there is a difference uh, between the love of Allah and the love of Yahweh is that there is a difference in the qualification for love. 
In Surah Miriam 1996, it says, On those who believe and work good deeds of righteousness will Allah most gracious bestow his love. Allah's love is conditional. In stark contrast, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrated his love for us that by this, that while we were still sinners, God died for us. Uh, Dr. Imad Shahidi uh, says the following. He says, For moral attributes to be active in Allah, apart from creation, it requires a relationship within this God. Otherwise, God would need to become dependent on his creation to exercise them. Uh, therefore, this is exactly what we see. There's no adequate relationship that can exist in a one universal being. And a triune relationship is others, uh, others' love and not self-love. In fact, the glory of the Trinity is that the honor of each person is derived and given back to the other. This love and humility not only overflow in the creation, but also in Christ's death on the cross. The formal dominant historic Asherite position, though, is on that in this attributes of God, they, that these moral attributes that were deduced from God is part of God's power, but not his essential nature. This should be problematic for Muslims when they actually conceive and think of this problem. The problem with an absolute unity is that an ontologically pure unity essentially equates to nothingness. Uh, and it renders the concept of divinity neither picturable nor conceivable, and it leaves everything, therefore, meaningless. So, next point. What about uh, this God and his knowability? Uh, there's a lot of emphasis in Christianity placed on the nobility of God. And let me describe to you what it means when we speak about the Christian conception of the nobility of God. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 mentions that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Uh, theologian Thomas Schreiner says that uh, the sun reflects God's glory and represents the nature uh, and the character of the one true God. And Christ is the definition of God. And Christianity finds the true picture of their God in the expressed person of Jesus Christ. Jesus exhausts the very definition of God through the revelation of his being. That is what Jesus speaks of when he says in John 14 verse 9, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The first distinction between the revelation of God in the Quran and the Bible is that God is ultimately known through Jesus Christ. Uh, and we did a debate last year uh, with my friend Ahmed Pandor, and we looked at the titles that Christ bears in the Quran, uh, and I've not received an answer yet. Even though some of the titles are mentioned, like Messiah, etc., etc., they are not defined in the Quran. The Quran has to lean on the Bible to describe those titles. Uh, John 17, verse 3, we heard it quoted. It says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There is no knowledge of God where there is no true revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what Ephesians 1, 17, Colossians 2, verse 2 mentions. The essential character of God or the God of, uh, that's revealed in the Bible is love. And as a result of this love and this very nature of love, this life seeks to be made known. Uh, in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave. The initiative of salvation again comes from God, which is very different in the Quran. In 1 John 4, verse 7 to 9, and also verse 16, it describes the, certain, the, the, the absolute uh, evidence that this God is known and conceptualized as love. Allow me to give you a quote from jo uh, Dr. John MacArthur uh, that writes on uh, the Christian God. He says the following, he says, the Christian God is not an unknown impersonal force, but he is a, be a personal being with the full attributions of personality, volition, feeling, and intellect. God in Christianity is known through Jesus Christ, and we are assured that he is a qualitative love, which is essential to our understanding of his being. And then he quotes 1 John 4 verse 7. When we look at the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran, these are cardinal differences. The, uh, uh, let me just say this, that the ins Islamic conception of the nobility of God, how we can know him, uh, uh, Rami al-Rifal in his book, Imam al-Ghazi and the Foundations of Al-Qaeda, affirms that all this, that is the uh, love of God and the attributes of God, uh, is impossible to imagine to the human mind. For whatever the mind conceives and define uh, insofar as it is, uh, in as far as what Allah is, it is limited by space and time. 
Uh, ultimately, there's a noticeable, uh, a notable Islamic scholar that affirms that Allah is ultimately inconceivable, which leads them to negative theology that rather describes what Allah is not. So there's never a positive uh, description of Allah, but there's uh, rather a description of the nature and character of Allah on what he is not. Uh, because uh, we can see that, as the scholar mentions, whatever the mind conceives Allah to be, he is not. Uh, the heart of Islam is to submit to God and to obey Him, uh, and we can see that the priority is not to know Him, because you cannot really know Him. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, Ahmed Hulusi adds, he says, Allah is Samat, and this is a Muslim scholar. If we take an extensive look at the meaning of this word, we will see that Samat means the following, a whole without any void or emptiness, impermeable, uh, imp nothing penetrates into it, nothing extends out from it, it is pure and only. Uh, therefore, the noticeable Christian scholar Samuel Zwemer says the following. He says, we will find in the study of Orthodox Islam uh, that it is a, a conception of a deistic and pantheistic God. Theologians and philosophers have pantheistic views of Allah making him the sole force in the universe, but the popular, popular thought of him uh, owning to the iron weight of the doctrine of fatalism is deistic. Allah stands aloof from his creation, only his power is felt, and men are like his pieces on a chessboard, and he's only the player. Creation itself was not intended so much for the manifestation of Allah's glory or the outburst of his love as for the sample of his power. As Rema adds, he says, the worst form of monotheism, therefore, is that uh, the monotheism that makes God pure will. World divorced from reason and love. Islam, instead of being a progressive and completed idea, goes to the lower level than the religions that it claims to suppress or to supplant. What we can see, though, is that the very progressive revelation of the Old and New Testament uh, in the Scriptures is that God uh, is ultimately a God that longs to reveal himself. Uh, amongst these people. The sad reality is then that when we look at the God of Islam, we are left with a God that's beyond comprehension and therefore beyond notice. Uh, Geislin Salib says the following, he says, for Islamic theology, God has willed and has acted in many ways, but these acts are in no ways reflected uh, or reflect uh, reflections of the divine character behind them. Uh, Sira Yudan uh, Ali in uh, 1173, uh, he wrote a, a renowned book called Imali, affirms that the attributes of God or Allah are not Allah himself, but neither are they distinct nor independent from his being. Rather, his attributes as manifestations of his beings and works are eternal, kadim, and impersonal. Therefore, we can say that even by the effects of Allah, we do not really know what he is like. The adherents of Islam can be truthful about who they worship, uh, can, can be truthful about who they worship, and the worship rendered to his being is purely a gamble on the uh, ultimate unknown. When we look, therefore, uh, at uh, the conception uh, uh, of this God, we can note, like the Apostle John, when he writes to the Samaritans in, in John chapter 4, verse 22 to 23, when he speaks to them, he, says the, he recalls Jesus saying the following, You worship what you do not know. And we worship what we do know. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. And then the Samaritans confirmed, verse 41, 42. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know this one is indeed the Savior. Speaking of Jesus Christ of the world. Philippians 3 verse 8, more than that, says the following, I count all things are lost to compare it to the surpassing excellence of knowing Jesus my Lord, for whom I have lost all things, and I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. When we look at the Christian conception of the Trinity, we can affirm what Kenneth Craig says. He says, belief in the Trinity does not make God less one, but rather more one. For in Christ, God demonstrates that he alone is God. Uh, when we look at the central perceptions of both, both Christian and Islamic theologies, we can see that there's a clear perspective uh, in the way both of our faiths articulate our understanding. The central purpose, though, of the Christian scriptures is to lead people to a place where they know their God, where the central purpose in the Islamic text is for people to submit 
to their God. In the conception, uh, in the Islamic conception, Jesus is therefore just an example of submission, where in the Christian conception, he's the very definition of God, as we read in the text, and the example of submission and intimate worship. Uh, in his letter to Timothy, uh, 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 we can see quite clearly uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says the following, The mystery of godliness is great, speaking of Christ. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached amongst the nations, believed on the world, taken up into glory. And the apostle John therefore writes, We know that the Son of God has come and give us understanding so that we may know the true God. This is in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. We are in the true God, the one that is his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. There's therefore no doubt in the Christian conception of God as to whom this person of Jesus Christ is. Unfortunately, we can see today that there's a lot of misunderstandings surround uh, the attributes and, and also what we can perceive uh, uh, to, be co to call the, the nature of Christ's divinity. And, and let me just in the last minute and a half go in on that. When we look at the understanding of the Christian conception of God, we are saying that Jesus Christ incarnated, uh, uh, was incarnated in his flesh uh, into this world. Uh, now, I've heard the Muslim objection that stated and said the following. It says that God cannot enter his creation, or he would not. It's beneath him to enter his creation. The question that I want to ask my Muslim friends today, okay, I'm not going to go to the Quran and speak of Moses and ask who was in the burning bush and who spoke from the burning bush. Uh, what I am saying is simply this. Can anything in the created order, what we see around us, what we perceive around us, make God less than God? Is anything powerful enough to make God less than God? No. Nothing can make God less God. Just because God took on flesh and he dwelled amongst ordinary men does not mean that he became less God. It simply means he took unto himself a human form. Secondly, I want to ask you, can anything in the created order make God more than God? No. Nothing can make God more than God because God is the Almighty. He's the indivisible. So therefore, when Jesus takes on perfect flesh, and I like the definition of Dr. R.C. Sproul, when he says that Jesus was not just fully God and fully man, he says he was truly man and truly God. We're not describing a, a contradiction of terms because we are speaking of two different realities. I've got 12 seconds, 11, 10. Nine, eight, seven. So, thank you for listening to me. I had to rush through so many things. And let me say my last three, uh, uh, three minutes, uh, that if you want the notes of this, uh, you are more than welcome to ask, and I'll send it to you. Is that okay? Thanks, guys. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Uh, well, I'm going to quickly run down uh, this rebuttal because uh, you know I'm not reading notes unfortunately but uh, Pastor Rudolph has come with uh, you know like an essay of notes but I, I'm hoping that the 15 minutes is enough to you know demystify everything that uh, Pastor Rudolph said. Pastor Rudolph said there is only one God and he said there are three eternal persons described in scripture the Father, Son and the Spirit and the deity is evident. And uh, my reply to that is, Rudolf, Pastor Rudolf, I don't know from which Bible you are talking about that these things are evident. Because from the Bible that I read and from the Bible that you have, these things do not exist. And it's like, you know, uh, trying to make orange juice uh, using apples. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You cannot bring these things out of the Bible. The Bible is very clear that God is one and unique. And you cannot use the Bible to derive or to go at such, you know, a, a doctrine, which, is, uh, which uh, is the, you know, triune doctrine. It's like, you know, taking a bus and uh, putting people in a bus going to Zimbabwe. I have some Zimbabwean friends who are here with us today and expecting that they will get to Cape Town. So it doesn't make sense. If you put somebody in a bus going to Cape Town, he will go to Cape Town. If you, uh, you don't expect him to find him in Zimbabwe. So uh, this is uh, one, one uh, thing that uh, I find Pastor Rudolph, uh, logical consistency is not, is not one of his strong points. We go to the second thing that uh, Pastor Rudolph mentioned, and this is chapter 28 
and verse 19. And he said this baptismal formula is, you know, uh, triune. And we read from the encyclopedia of the Catholics, the Catholic Encyclopedia 2. We read page 263 and it says the baptismal triune formula, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When it says that go, chapter 28, 28 verse 19 of the book of Matthew, it says go and make disciples of the world, uh, baptizing them by the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This did not exist in, in the Bible. This is an addition and every, any person, I'm actually disappointed because I hope uh, Pastor Rudolph is one of the scholars or at least a student of knowledge. You cannot quote this verse because all Christians know and it's in your encyclopedias that this is a later addition and it's not the word of God. This is very clear as it has been stated in the Catholic encyclopedia. We also know that uh, I'm going to give another challenge today and because the first 5,000 rand has just been ignored. I'm going to add another 5,000 rand. If this verse is actually true, chapter 28, verse 19 of the book of Matthew, I want a single verse because Jesus commands his disciples in this verse. He says, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you give me a single verse from the book of Acts of the Apostles or from the book of Matthew to the book of Revelation, where the, uh, where the disciples use this formula and baptize people by the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rudolf, you're shaking your head. You understand what I'm saying. So I hope you take the 5,000 home. I want a verse where the disciples baptize using this name. Another problem that comes with this verse that he quoted is that, you know, the Father has a name. As he quoted, he said, Yahweh or Jehovah. This is the name of the Father. The Son is Yeshua or Jesus, a, re a renowned name. Everybody knows who Jesus is. But what is the name of the Holy Spirit? The Christians don't know, the Muslims know. So uh, we can set up another meeting where we can teach you who the Holy Spirit is because you worship him, but you don't know his name. And if you know the name, another 5,000 rand. We are going to 10,000 rand now. If you give me the name of the Holy Spirit, you know, this is just free money flying around. So uh, that is one thing. Another problem is that the father has a throne according to the Bible and it says uh, the, the, the son has a throne which is Jesus. And this throne is not just for Jesus. It's not unique to Jesus. Because if we read chapter 19 verse 27 of the book of Matthew, we find out that the 12, uh, the 12 uh, disciples will sit in 12 different thrones. But the Holy Spirit does not have a throne. Give me a verse in the Bible which says that the Holy Spirit has a throne. So they cannot be co-equal. They cannot be, you cannot term them as being co-equal. And then he says that Jesus being the eternal son of God. This is the most contradictory sentence that anybody can make up. This sentence is, is deformed in so many levels. Because what is begetting? What is a son? A son is begat. You beget a son. For example, a few months ago I had a son. A son is begat in time, right? What does eternally mean? Eternally transpasses time, matter, space. Doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. So you can, how can you procreate eternally? It doesn't make sense. This in the English grammar will be an incomprehensible speech. You'd be speaking in tongues if you say that Jesus uh, is the eternal son of God because eternal and son cannot be put in the same sentence. Because being, uh, this is, you know, a, a logical inconsistency. Again, it is illogical, it is paradoxical, and it is incoherent, incomprehensible uh, in, in, in all aspects. Uh, you cannot eternally procreate. We go to the next point. Tell me if I have 10 minutes. The, I have 10 minutes. Okay, you're going to add me the minute you just spoke. <laughs> So we Muslims disagree with whatever uh, Pastor Rudolph just preached to us, the triune God. Why? Because it's not in the Bible, it's not in the Quran. This is something that is a doctrine that he brought up uh, or, or people before him brought up. It is something the Quran says in chapter 9 verse 30. وَيُضَاهِئُونَ قَوْلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ They just take the words that were, were used by the people who who, you know, disbelieved before them. But it's not in the Bible. It cannot be found in the Bible, just like we explained earlier. Because if you say that the son gave up, uh, according, to the, uh, according to the book of uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says that the son was in the nature of God, and he didn't find that nature being something to hold on to. 
That is what Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says. And he came down as a servant. So he gave up his uh, be, being God. So he's, not, he's no longer God. We don't have a God anymore. Because the God you know, came down and he gave up his uh, essential divine nature. And uh, if, you give us, if you give up those es your essence, which are the properties which are necessary for your existence, then you, you, you no longer are defined as a God. So Jesus being, uh, sees being a, a God, or God sees being a God, this is again paradoxical and illogical in so many you know, uh, levels. And uh, to say it quite frankly, it's a pagan idea. Many people have said this about it. Unitarian Christians have said this is a pagan idea, not Muslims. So if you're going to go after anyone, go after your fellow Christians who are Unitarians. Uh, one, one more question is I'd like to ask if Jesus was God and he didn't find being God something. Tell me if I have five minutes. He didn't find God being a God something to hold on to and he came down as a man. That means he came down temporarily. To, for your salvation and to die for your sins. Then we look at the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 55. Being led by the Holy Spirit, the disciple looked into the skies and he saw what Jesus uh, sitting at the right hand of God, standing by the right hand side of God, which we would call Ashabul Yameen, meaning Jannah to us Muslims. But the Christians believe it as, you know, you need to learn a lot of things from the Muslims. They think it's the actual hand of God. So, Jesus is a man. He said he saw the Son of Man being led by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus took on the flesh to come only to this earth, then why is he flesh up in heaven? And when he comes back, he says that he is still going to be flesh and bones. So, why, where is his divine nature? Where is the Word? He was a Word before. Why didn't he go back to being the Word? Why is he still flesh and bones in heaven? If you, you want to put him in... In, in the Trinity as a triune God. So I'm not going to use fancy words as the article uh, the brother was reading, uh, Pastor Rudolph. We are going to go to the next argument. The next argument that Pastor Rudolph brought up, let me go th uh, through this very quickly. He says the Bible describes three persons. We already said that that, that, that does not exist, and we offered many we're hoping to hear back from him. Each member works equally, he said. It, this, is, this does not make sense. Any person who has read two verses from the Bible knows that Jesus is not equal to God. Chapter 14, verse 28 of the book of John says, The Father is greater than I. So Jesus, the Father is greater than Jesus. You know, we have the signs in mathematics. You know this sign, it means what? Greater than, lesser than. So the, just, you know, these are... These are things that you're supposed to comprehend very easily. Jesus says the Father is greater than I. Jesus does not have any knowledge. Jesus, in the book of Luke chapter 8, verse 40, I have five minutes. In the book of ch chapter 8, verse 40, going down to 44, a woman with hemorrhage came and she touched his, you know, he was wearing, just like today, unfortunately, I'm not wearing it, but the fellow Muslims are wearing it. Jesus was wearing that. And she touched him from the back. And what happened? You know, Jesus lost his, I'm not going to say it like that, but he said, who touched me? He didn't know who touched him. In the book of Mark chapter 11, Jesus did not know the season of the figs. In chapter 13, verse 32 of the book of Mark, Jesus says, I do not know the hour. He doesn't know the hour. Jesus does not know the day of judgment. Chapter 24, verse 36 of the book of Matthew, Jesus does not know the hour. So he doesn't have knowledge. He cannot be God and he cannot be co-equal with God and we can say so about so I'm going to there are many things that I haven't handled but I'm going to the three categories of Tawheed thank you very much uh, uh, Pastor Rudolph for mentioning this I'm very I would encourage you to keep studying uh, Islamic from Islamic sources uh, these are not uh, you cannot compare the three you know uh, categories of Tawheed with the three deities that you have uh, these are, you know, simply, we can, we can say the power of God, we can say the knowledge of God, and we can't say that these things are uh, completely exclusive and they are separate things. And this Tawheed, as we are told in chapter 4, verse 83, I don't have time to read the whole verse. 
that God, God tells us that the people who derive these teachings from the Quran know these things. And we can derive these three concepts from one verse. We told you to derive the Trinity from one verse and we give you 5,000 uh, rand today. We can derive it from the verse of chapter 19 verse 65 of the Quran, which says, Rabbu samawati wal ard, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, that is the Tawheed of Rububiyyah, Rabbu samawati wal ard, wa ma baynahuma, and everything that exists between it, fa'buduh, this is Tawheed uluhiya, that you should worship him, wastabil li'ubadati, and be steadfast in his worship. So we have the two categories, what do I have? So we have two categories of Tawheed. The third category, it says, this is one verse, رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فَعْبُدُهُ وَاسْتَغِرْ لِعْبَادَتِهِ هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيَا The third is Asma wa Sifat. So these three, I've, 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 I've brought them down for you very clearly. I've derived them from you for one, from one verse. I can derive it from the very first chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha. I can derive it from the very last chapter, chapter 114 of the Quran, Surah Al-Nas. I can derive these three you know, categories of Tawheed, but you failed miserably to uh, uh, provide uh, evidence for this from... He says the eternal Qur'an which exists with Allah. We believe that the Qur'an is the Kalam al-Azali, which is from God. God speaks, and the speech of God, you can tell us if uh, he's saying that the Qur'an, being the speech of God, is a separate entity that exists eternally, other than God. This does not make sense. And he quoted the Ash'ari and the Mu'tazilites. Uh, the time is very limited, but if you give us the time, I'm ready to debate this sex with you. I'm ready to, to do that even after this debate. If you'd like, we can take a cup of coffee and I can explain a few things to you about this. So the Kalam al-Azali of God, this is like the speech of God, which is uncreated. Kalam Allah, غير makhluq. It is not created. That is the Quran. He continues to say that the solitary divine cannot be loved. He is saying that God alone cannot be loved. He needs people to love so that it doesn't make sense. Because if you are alone in the desert, then what happens? Do you stop being a loving person? You don't stop being a loving person just because you don't have a person to love. This does not make sense. And if you start adding up uh, other partners to God, why stop at three? Why say that three is the, you know, uh, uh, the place to stop? You can go to a thousand just like the Indians have. Why? Uh, he says the qualification of love is uh, different from the, the Quran because the Quran says the qualification, uh, the, the Bible says that God is love and the Quran qualifies, you know, you have to have certain qualities for God to love you. That is not true because the formula in which the Quran starts with is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the, the, the one I just used right now, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the merciful. So God is compassionate and loving. God is Al-Wadud. And if we read the book of Psalms, chapter 5, verse 6, if we read the book of Psalms, chapter 11, verse 5, Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 23, Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 12, we read the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, verse 30, we read uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 8, we find that God says he does not love the wicked. So this is the Bible. You're saying God is love. And here in the Bible, in so many verses I've quoted, I can give you a hundred verses. It says that God does not love certain groups of people. So this means that uh, your argument is incons inconsistent, and I am willing, uh, it's time. So uh, I am willing to give you the, what are we at right now? 15,000. If you, if, you if you prove to me the few things that, and I hope you quoted them, because last time I asked and you didn't reply to anything I said. So I don't want to go home with this money. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Uh, yes, uh, the reason I didn't make any statement on this opening argument is because I had to give my opening argument, so now we can do the rebuttals. Uh, but when we look at the understanding of what I tried to negate, what I was trying to say in my three points was simply the following. When we look at the actual essence of Allah, He is not known by His very own essence, and even Islamic scholars say, there, say that. And therefore, if Allah is other, He cannot express His love in the same manner than what we express it, because He is other. He is above His arch. He's, be, he's beyond His attributes. And that is what I said. It has an impact on His nobility, the way we perceive Him, that which we perceive God to be, He is not. Remember, I said that. There was nothing said about that, nor was it addressed. Let me also say that when we speak about the essential understanding of that, uh, in his opening argument he mentioned that the Creator shares his, es his essence with the creation. 
we are saying it's not inconsistent with the idea that we find amongst Muslims. When we look at Muslims, we can see quite clearly that they also believe uh, in, in liberation. They believe that the Quran became book, and therefore we have the eternal Quran that is expressed in a book. Here's my study Quran. Forgive me, it's got post note, post notes in it because I read it often. I read it every day. But that book is not the eternal speech of Allah. That which is contained in that book is eternal, but that which is printed is temporal. So here we do. We have a contradiction. No, we've got two spheres. We've got an eternal sphere, and we've got a created sphere, and that is in no contradiction of the eternality of the Quran itself and its uncreatedness. That's exactly what we say when it comes to the hypostatic union. When we look at the hypostatic union, afford us the same. The eternal word of God became flesh, he dwelt amongst ordinary men, and we beheld his glory with us. So there's nothing contrary to what we believe. We, we heard the following being said. We heard, uh, uh, also, let me, let me pick. Uh, we heard the following being said. We heard that in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, uh, that... Uh, in actual fact, there's a statement that has been made, ultimately, uh, that uh, the young, rich young ruler uh, basically uh, uh, is affirming the unity of God. Absolutely. Christians are not saying there's three gods. The greatest command is the Shema. But yes, please read a little bit further. Read in verse 35 to 37. Jesus in verse 35 and 37 of Mark chapter 12 is affirming his deity. Uh, you, you said again, show me a passage that says one being three persons. Uh, Muslims commonly assume that the Old Testament affirms absolute Unitarianism. And what we are simply simply saying is, is that is not the case. Often we will hear, show me a passage where that says one being and three persons. I'm going to turn the tables on you tonight and ask the following. Can you show us a scripture that says God is one being and one person? Uh, and let me say that passage does not exist. Because we both are using articulated positions that we are saying by our own speech, which is deduced from our perspective and religious texts. Uh, the language that uh, the disciples used to describe the unity of God and the Old Testament patriarchs is not the same as today. Language grows and therefore we use language today as we know it to describe our own individual positions. Therefore, the demand that is placed uh, to explicitly articulate a position is simply illogical and inconsistent with the demand that was placed on the text, and I would say even with the Quran. Uh, we heard it said also that God cannot die, and God cannot be ignorant, and we hear all these questions. Let me sum it up. Uh, the, the question pertaining to the dual nature of Christ was, I think, very well articulated in the beginning of my introduction. Uh, if you say the person of Jesus Christ cannot embody two radical different perspectives, one of imminent infinitude and one of transcendent infinitude, you just do not know uh, the God of the Bible, which is Jesus Christ. But even further than that, if you deny the dual nature of Christ, you also use the, uh, lose the God of the Old Testament. Why am I saying that? Let me give you a scripture. Let me give you an example. Example he used. He said, God cannot change his mind. Numbers 23 verse 19. By the way, that speaks of the surety of God's decree, not the ontology of his nature. But when we look at the scripture, we can see quite clearly that in Exodus 32 verse 14, Psalms 106 verse 45, it says that God does change his mind. So what do we have? Do we have a radical contradiction? No. We have one God that occupies two radically different perspectives. One is the director of history and one is the actor in it. It's the same God with two different perspectives. This God of the Old Testament dwells with his people in the tabernacle but also transcends the tabernacle much like Jesus' incarnation in the New Testament. Therefore, biblical Trinitarians therefore believe that the New Testament revelation of Jesus Christ is the culmination of the Old Testament Testament and not a deviation from it. And this is important to understand. We heard John 14, 28, the Father is greater than I. And let me just say this, I wish we had time to go into this, because when we look at the Trinity, and like I described, in the economy of the Trinity, there is different tasks. But here's the thing, in our mindset, in the Christian Bible, just because there's a difference in function amongst the triune uh, persons of God, it does not mean that there's an inferiority of nature. In John 14, verse 28, Jesus speaks speaks in this chapter about his ontological union with the Father and shows that he's also in submission to the Father according to verse 28. That's what we expect when we read about the incarnation, Philippians chapter 2. But we note that he mentions in verse 12 of that same chapter that his disciples will do greater works than him. Does this mean that his disciples are ontologically superior to Jesus? 
Absolutely not. This passage speaks of the economic superiority of the father to the son in accomplishing the task of salvation like I described in the beginning. God enacts both leadership in the father and submission in the son. Uh, we hear the scripture being quoted, John 17 verse 3, uh, in your opening argument that only one true God. Uh, remember my definition of the Trinity. Uh, I clearly stated that there is a clear distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit, and that is what we see in John 17 verse 3. It shows that Jesus is equal, uh, equally necessary in position of salvation for both the Son and the Father. Uh, and Muslims usually when they quote that scripture, I always used to say, do you really have the Son as described in the scripture? Because if you don't, uh, you will die in your sin. That's what Jesus says in John 8, verse 24. But listen to this. When we look at John 17, verse 3, it says in verse 5 that Jesus mentions that he preexisted with the Father, actually, not notionally. Uh, uh, there's a, a personal pronoun in the Greek called parasoi, which denotes and, and speaks of even before the world began. Uh, in John 6, verse 62, Jesus affirms against his divine heavenly occupation before the incarnation. Also know that Jesus possesses the divine prerogatives and the divine name of God in verse 10 and 11 of John 17. Jesus also sanctifies himself in verse 19 of John 17. And he shows quite clearly that he emanates with the glory of Yahweh. But Yahweh, as Yahweh says in Isaiah 42 verse 18, I will share my glory with no one. But Jesus claims that glory. Why does Jesus do it? Because he's one with the Father. Uh, we can also see quite clearly that this Jesus is therefore not an ordinary man. You see, this is this passage of scripture that is quoted in John chapter 14. Uh, we heard portions being said like, can you show me a Trinitarian chapter and a Trinitarian passage? Well, let me read you one. Okay, uh, in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says the following, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. Father, Spirit, Son, uh, the world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you. It's not Muhammad in the future. He's going to remain with the actual disciples at that very time. He remains with you and he will be in you. Uh, and that is definitely not Muhammad unless he's pre-existing. Uh, again, I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus says. I will come to you. Uh, so when we use scriptures, listen. Text without context is pretext. We cannot use little passages of scripture to derive doctrines from it. Uh, we also heard it being said uh, that uh, uh, Jesus uh, is not really explicitly known as God. Let me say this. You know, in the book of Acts, we heard the book of Acts being mentioned. Uh, let me say this. Uh, we call on the name of Jesus to be saved, according to the scriptures. We get baptized in his name. We call on his name to get, uh, to get things work in our prov uh, providential favor. We call on his name to cast out demons and to heal people. He's the one that will ultimately judge the living and the dead. All power dominion is, for, is given to him forever and ever. And his name is above every name. Uh, and that is all recognized in the New Testament. But why does nobody then just simply say, sorry guys, he was not God. Scripture makes it clear often, over and over again, that this Jesus was more than a mere man. Uh, let me look at a few scriptures. I'm going to uh, not use notes because I was sort of accused that I'm using notes, but I just type quick. Okay? But let me look at a few passages of scripture that have been mentioned. We heard the passage of scripture mentioned in Galatians chapter 3, and we hear the following being said. We said that Galatians chapter 3 verse 20 describes or derives a reality that is ultimately unknown to us. Let me read to you what Galatians chapter 4 says. That's a chapter just after what was actually mentioned. And it says the following, again in verse 4, but when the completion of time came, God sent his son born of, a woman, uh, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because we are sons, God has sent his spirit. There's another triune passage of scripture, Father, Spirit, Son in union, working out our salvation in time. Uh, we heard another passage of scripture mentioned, I hope I get to all of it, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And we hear it said, you see, he was just a man. Jesus was just a man. This is what the passage of Scripture says. Well, when you read chapter 2, please go a little bit further. We cannot chop up the Bible and use singular verses to describe full realities. Let me read to you the Scripture that have been described. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, a man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom and a testimony in the proper time. What does it speak of? It speaks of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It speaks of him as being the mediator before God, before man, for all of us. There is no other mediator before God. It's not Muhammad. 
Okay? There's no other mediator before God and man but the man Jesus Christ. But then listen a little bit further. It says the following in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, This man, Jesus Christ, he was manifest in the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached amongst the Gentiles, believed on his glory, and taken up into glory. We hear the book of Acts being quoted, uh, and then we hear the following being said. When you look at the book of Acts, we can see quite clearly that, that there's sort of a Pauline influence on all of us. Let me read to you what the apostles or the Christian church believed before the coming of Paul. Uh, so let me just give you a quick summation from the first five chapters. Uh, this is all believed and affirmed by the first Christian community before Paul. Listen, Jesus was Lord amongst them, Acts 1 verse 21. They were witnesses of his resurrection from the dead, Acts chapter 1 verse 22. Anyone calling on the name of Jesus will be saved, Acts chapter 2 verse 21. Jesus was affirmed by the Father with signs and miracles, absolutely, Acts chapter 2 verse 22. We affirm that. God the Father they had a plan that Christ had to fulfill to ransom us of all our sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 23. Jesus was killed on a cross. Acts chapter 2 verse 23. See, you cannot use Acts chapter 22 at the expense of Acts chapter 23. Further, what we also see in the book of Acts is even though you use Acts chapter 2, let me read to you the full context because you need to understand what is actually preached here. When you look at Acts chapter 2, you can see quite clearly at Pentecost, it says the following and he's drawing from the Old Testament scriptures from the book of Joel and he shows that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Guess what happens? Just a few verses after that, in verse 39, we can see that we call on the providential name of Jesus Christ to be saved, but it's Jesus who pours out his own spirit. What happens? Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus is the source of life. Acts chapter 3 verse 15. Jesus was foretold through the prophets of old in Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Uh, and they were actual eyewitnesses of this historical person, Jesus Christ. And let me just say to you, these historical people that have written these books affirm that he was Lord and God. It's just a fact. So, who is the Holy Spirit? We heard it being said, the Holy, Holy Spirit is sort of impersonal force. The Holy Spirit's not known by a name. Uh, let me say something to you. When we look at the book of Acts, uh, we're in the book of Acts, so let's stick there. We can see quite clearly that the book of Acts affirm in verse 3, Acts chapter 5, verse 3, that he's an actual person. He's disappointed. He experiences emotions. And ultimately, he smites too in the very first Christian service because they're disobedient to God. Uh, and he was not just a force. So we cannot come to the text, we cannot come to the biblical text and just affirm and, and say that all of these realities are, are present within the text, but ultimately they do not describe a reality. Uh, we heard the following scripture also read uh, in John chapter 8, verse four, I think verse 40. John chapter 8, we hear the following being said about Jesus. And let me read it to you. Uh, I've got a few minutes left, so let's have fun. Uh, and I love to do exegetics. We do this with our students very often as well. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, sorry, John chapter 4, uh, we heard in John chapter 8, sorry, I'm in John chapter 4, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we heard the following mentioned. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 verse 40, we heard it being said that the scripture says the following, but now you're trying to kill me because I was a man. And again we say, you see, he was just a man. Well, read a little bit further, because in verse 58, Jesus speaks and he says emphatically, I assure you before Abraham was I am, ego emi, which draws from the, Latin, uh, uh, from, the, from the actual Old Testament text in Isaiah 43 verse 30, where Jesus actually attributes to himself the divine name of Yahweh himself. So we cannot come to the text and we cannot say simply that ultimately when we look at the text, that the text speaks impartial about the person of Jesus Christ. We heard that the scripture, uh, for instance, like Matthew 28 verse 9, according to the Catholic dictionary, was not in the text. Great, that's why I'm not a Catholic, uh, because I'm not an anti-supernaturalist. When Jesus speaks in John 14, 26, he says that the sole function of the Holy Spirit will be to remind the disciples of everything he has said. What about uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19? Well, we find it in Tertullian in the first century, Hippolytus Cyprian. Uh, uh, we find it in the Didache in the late first century. Uh, so what we find is that this scripture was already attested in the first century of the Christian church, yet the Catholic uh, dictionary wants to tell us 2,000 years later that it wasn't the original text, guys. Uh, I think not. I think let's go to the original sources. Further, let me just say to you that the apostles himself affirmed the Trinity. And let me give you just four guys and four scriptures. You can write them down for those who are watching. You can also uh, just look at it. In John's gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 21, 
uh, well, the whole of John chapter 1, chapter 21, verse 24, we see Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. We see Paul in Colossians 1, 16, Philippians 2, verse 2, uh, verse 5 to 11, and Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. We can look at all of these scriptures, and they attest to the wonderful person of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. Thank you, guys. Bismillah. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Five minutes is really a stretch, but we're still going to uh, look at the Shema. He said, uh, Shema Israelu, Adonai Laheinu, Adonai Achad, which uh, is in the Hebrew, chapter 6, verse 4, and chapter 12, verse 29 of the book of uh, Mac, and chapter 6, verse 4 of the book of Deuteronomy. He said that uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, is a plural unity, and not, it doesn't mention one. And if there's any Jew, is there any Jew in the house? There's no Jew in the house. You're not a Jew. <laughs> if there was a Jew in the house, you would laugh at this. Because uh, uh, Brian, uh, Pastor Brian always tells his students, and I've been here so many times, and he, say, he tells them, you know, scripture without context is pretext. Text without context, text without context is pretext. That's the same thing you're doing, the same fallacy. What we're witnessing here today are logical fallacies and chasing your own tail around things. Because the, the context of this is only one. And the funny thing is that all the Israelis believed in God as one. And they believed, so they were all wrong. And Rudolf is right here today. <laughs> it does, you know, it doesn't uh, make sense like that. So we, go, we continue, it says... Uh, he once said that Matthew wrote, this is my son who I'm well pleased. That is chapter 3, verse 16 of the book of Matthew. Uh, and uh, that does not uh, signify God. That, that was not God speaking. Uh, I would say it really frankly because uh, it says that the heavens opened and the spirit of God descended like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my son, my beloved son who I'm well pleased. So this voice is not God's voice because it does not say that it is God's voice. It does not say that this is the voice of God. It, it simply says that a voice from heaven came. And Jesus denies that it is the, the voice of God in the book of John chapter 5 verse 37. He says, the father who has sent me, his, uh, uh, his voice you have never heard at any time. So it's definitely not God. Uh, Rudolf had that one wrong. He says, chapter 10 verse 30, uh, 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 you know, of the book of John, I and the father are one. He who has seen me has seen the father. I and the father are one. I and the father are one does not signify uh, just like he says, text without context is pretext. We have to go, uh, we have to take that home today. So chapter 10 verse 30 says that uh, uh, I and the Father are one. This is the language of the Bible. This is a biblical language that was used before. It's not unique to Jesus. If you read the book of Genesis chapter 10 verse 30, you find that uh, Esau was speaking to uh, uh, Jacob and Jacob told him that is Israel. He told Jacob, seeing your face is like seeing the face of the Father. So is he part of the Godhead also? Now we have four in the Godhead. No, it doesn't work like that. Again, we continue and we see that uh, today we, we have proved to you the nature of God in Islam. It's very simple. And I hope everybody goes, go, goes with that at home and, and, and uh, you know, believes that there's only one God and there's no, none to be worshipped except him. He says that... Uh, that Muhammad is not a mediator. Jesus was the mediator, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And he says that uh, this is, again, a, a language that you have to understand. I don't know how you came up with this, because Jesus was a messenger, and everybody who saw Jesus, Matthew chapter 21, verse 11, all the, uh, the, the whole town of Jerusalem knew Jesus as a prophet. So a mediator means a prophet. And to just thread the point, the same verse says, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, not the Son of God. The man Christ Jesus. So you have to look at that verse again. And uh, he says that uh, who came to die. Jesus was not willing to die. And then this again proves that Jesus is not part of the Godhead. Because in 26 verse 39 in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus goes forward and, and, and puts his head to the ground and says, Father, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus' will and the will of the Father are not the same. So they cannot be in a trinity because they will be fighting in the trinity because Jesus has a will for the cup to pass away, but the Father wants to induce the cup on Jesus. So we can't have three gods, and this is the same thing that the, uh, the Quran says. If there were uh, more gods than one, then Allah says, La that the earth, the earth will be in, in chaos. 
Um, one more thing is that, uh, how many minutes do I have? So in my 25 seconds, uh, there are many things that we asked today that uh, uh, haven't been able to be proved. We asked, for example, he said he's not a Catholic and he won't deny, you know, uh, the verse, chapter 28, verse 19 of the Bible. But uh, if we look very clearly, I asked a simple question. If this verse is really from the Bible and from Jesus' words, give me a single verse where the disciples baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that verse does not exist. I'd like to take my last minutes to invite you to Islam. Starting with uh, Pastor, Pastor Rudolf. I welcome you to Islam. And may God bless you all for being here. And uh, embracing Islam, just like the Christian brother over there said, is just uh, proclaiming to us that God is one and Muhammad is final messenger and believing in all the other prophets. Thank you. You've been a lovely audience. And uh, may God bless you and guide you. Thank you. Again, I want to say thanks to every single one that was here. Some of you came far. Uh, some of you uh, actually took time off on a Friday night to be at a religious discussion. Um, and... I want to say thanks from my bottom of my heart. Uh, and I also want to say that the, the Muslim community in South Africa has been incredibly good to me. Okay? Uh, and if we are going to take whatever is happening amongst us with us as friends sitting together disagreeing to the rest of the world, how better is this world going to be? Um, so I want to say thank you to Abdul Rahman. Uh, he's got a hectic schedule. I don't know how he does everything. Um, but thanks for that. And I really pray that we will do this again maybe in Kenya or, or you know, wherever you are uh, because you travel a lot. Um, and I really mean this because it is important for us to have good-spirited discussions. And I, I really like him. Um, I wish everybody that uh, I, I've met before, um, I, I want to state and say that for the Christian friends, there's nothing wrong with going to a Muslim and asking them as well, what do you believe? And that's really what I want to see. Um, unfortunately, in the last few years, um, there's been a lot of animosity and a lot of Christians that have actually been persecuted, and Muslims, for doing this, what we're doing tonight. Uh, you're being too soft on Muslims, or you're not saying anything right, or the starting point of our conversation should be the age of Aisha, you know, and stuff like that. I don't want to have conversations like that. I think as a cardinal importance, it's, un it, it's very important for us to understand who our God is and what he did. And for me personally, um, I'm not out to give aha moments or to say something that is going to put him in a corner. Uh, he's spoken of quite a few scriptures that um, I promise, I promise today. I'll make a, uh, I have a YouTube channel and I will look at those scriptures and I will reply to every single one of them. Because, you know, I also want to learn from him, but I also want him to learn from me because we're friends. And I say that because, you know, sometimes in a debate setting like this, trust me, it's very difficult to articulate a specific point because there's so little time. And I already have two and a half minutes left. But please, I, I want to I start off with the quote that Gary, uh, not Gary, sorry, our moderator gave uh, tonight. And I want to read this to you because this is of cardinal importance. He stated and he says, what coming to our minds when we think about God is of most importance about us. It reflects in the way we live, it reflects in the way we act, and ultimately it reflects ultimately in the way we influence this world. What I try to show to you tonight is simply, and I really did it, please, I didn't do it from a place of animosity towards the doctrines of the Quran. Uh, I read my Quran every day. I just read through Hadith Qudsi. I'm reading through all of the Hadith because I want to understand what Muslims believe. Uh, I've got it. I've got my own personal copies. I'm investing my money into Islamic literature because I want to know. Okay? But I ask the same. And what I'm seeing tonight is this. We cannot deduce arguments from singular verses. I cannot take one scripture and run with it and say, you see, all Muslims are violent because this is a scripture on jihad. And it says, wherever you find them, strike their necks. That's not the context. And we have to be fair with each other's scriptures. And what I see in the didactic and the scholarship of Islam today is not fairness. We have to take all of Scripture. And that is what I try to do. That is what I try to say. When we look at all of Scripture, we can see quite clearly that there's a definite difference in our understanding of the unity of God uh, in the, that is described in the Bible and the unity of God that is described in the Quran and in the Hadith. 
And trust me, I've got my Hadith Qudsi there. I've got a lot of things that I've, I'm sorry, I've written out and said, well, I don't understand this. And I go to my Muslim friends and I always say, show me what, what's going on here. Because I want to know who this God is when he declares himself to be the only God. And when I look at the Bible, I can recognize that this God speaks of himself. I'll be honest, uh, even though the NIV study uh, uh, book says that, for instance, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, 26 and 27, where it says, let us make man, uh, is a plural of majesty. The only problem with that is that was only created in the third century uh, as sort of a, uh, you know, a method of describing uh, monarchical systems. It was not at the time when, when Moses penned the book of Genesis almost 4,000 years before the New Testament, or 6,000 years before the New Testament. So we're looking at all of these different questions, and we are saying that when we look at the questions that have been asked, we understand that also, as I've shown, there's a central problem with the understanding of the love of Allah in the Quran and the Bible. They are different. We need to be honest about this. I've showed that Allah's love is conditional, where the God of the Bible has unconditional love. Okay, I also get a few seconds extra. Uh, I'm just asking to make my last point. Also, this influences the knowability of our God. This is very important for us because, let me say, when I read the Quran and the Hadith, there's definitely a compound unity that Muslims are not accounting for as revealed in their own text. And we didn't have time to look at it. But that's why I say, hopefully, this is not the last conversation that we have. So I want to say thank you to you. My time's up. Uh, but let me say and leave you with this, and I want to read it to you because this is of grave importance. Jesus speaks uh, very clearly to the religious Jews, uh, and he makes it absolutely sure that whatever we believe about him is of cardinal importance. And he says the following, and I want to read this to you in closing, and thank you for giving me a few seconds extra. You are from below, he told them, I'm from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore I told you that you will die in your sin, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This is very serious. Our religious beliefs have severe consequences. And I want to know and inform myself to see what is evidentially right. I thank you and I hope we can have a conversation again. And thank you to everyone that was here. Thank you, guys. Thank you for that, Pastor Rudolf. Um, once again, Abdul Rahman, we thank you for the time that you've taken out traveling far to the guys that came with you. We thank you for always supporting the guys that are coming out to do this, to each and every person that came out, as Pastor Rudolf said, especially on a Friday night. You know, we never take it lightly, but we trust that what you came for, you have received, that the truth was revealed to you. Pastor Rudolf says that it's not the first, we hope that it's not the first, that there will be many more to come. Um, as well from the Bible School College, we thank the Dean in the absence for opening the doors to each and every one of us for this debate. There will be another one happening in the year as well where for the Bible School students that is open up to everyone as well. You can follow it on the Facebook page of the Bible School College for details. But we trust that you've been blessed and as you depart, I'm not sure if uh, speakers will have time to, to interact with people as well. You're more than welcome to come and ask them questions or to engage with them for a few minutes, to engage with fellow people at ease here as well. We trust that you've been blessed and that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for